My name is Jav Parrish. Uh, welcome to you tonight and welcome to, um, we're still officially in test broadcast, but KODX is in fact on the air. And we are live streaming this. Uh, we're live streaming it. It'll also probably be on an archive of some point or another. And uh, because of that, we are going to keep the program tonight FCC compliant. Uh, so when you when we have Q and A, we uh, unfortunately don't have a seven hour delay so that we can uh, edit the obscenities and check with our libel lawyers and all that. So if you can just uh, keep it clean, we'd appreciate it. Uh, you know, it'd be a shame to lose our license within like three days of starting. Um, we'll work on that later. Um, Thank you all for being here. We really appreciate it. And um, what I would like to think of this as, given that it's been an enormous struggle to get this station and a number of other LPFMs around town on the air, uh, this is the start of something that we hope is going to be much larger um, in terms of uh, creating local programming that um, that KODX can do and that we can share with other LPFMs around town. There's uh, another LPFM down in Rainier Valley who's also having its launch party tonight. There's four or five of them that um, are coming on the air within about a month of each other right now uh, because the filing window is up all about the same time for Seattle and so the windows for getting things on the air was all about the same time. And uh, I think there are eight total licenses in Seattle. Uh, somebody can probably correct me about that when I get that wrong. But um, it's an era. It, it, uh, LPFM uh, was legalized by FCC just a few years ago. And uh, it's already been up and running in some other communities. Uh, Spokane has a really vibrant one. There's uh, others in around Washington State and around the Northwest. But it's relatively new to Seattle. And having something that is broadcasting on the air and then live streaming, and that allows us also to get on social media and have the credibility in the community that goes with actually having call letters and a license that we can wave around, um, it's really tremendously exciting. Um, it's particularly exciting for me. I mentioned this on Facebook last night. I moved back to Seattle in 1990, and one of the first things that I got involved in, in terms of uh, agitation, was a group of people that was trying to get a pirate radio station going in Seattle. And there were several of those efforts that I was involved in that others were involved in in Seattle throughout the 90s. This is pre-internet, then basically the idea is to try and break the information monopoly of uh, mainstream corporate uh, radio and newspapers and media that, uh, you know, are relatively expensive to produce and served as gatekeepers to information. Uh, the media landscape has changed. A lot of other efforts to get progressive radio going and to get progressive media going have come and gone over the last 25 or so years. Um, but this has been a long time coming, something that is an explicitly progressive news and public affairs station for Seattle. We've never actually had that. That's locally produced, locally programmed. Uh, the closest was uh, CBS Radio had a, a talk radio station that was mostly national talk, uh, Air America, for a couple of years, and they decided sports radio would be more profitable, and uh, there went that. So the idea is... Uh, not only progressive media institution, but a progressive media institution that is uh, by and for those of us who care about making the world a better place. Um, and that, um, that we don't have to worry about gatekeepers because, it's gatekeepers because it is a community project, because it is a nonprofit that's being operated on behalf of uh, the U District, the specific community uh, that the station serves, and the greater Seattle area and, you know, the world at large as well. Um, so it's really exciting because there's been a, a lot of efforts to get uh, this sort of a project going over the last few years. And I want to recognize in particular Mike McCormick, who's just done an incredible amount of work to uh, to get this station going. I mean, people, people have no idea. I, I've actually done it before uh, over the years. I had, before I ever got involved in, um, in, in, uh, doing activism or doing politics or doing writing. I had a career in uh, broadcast media uh, back in my uh, previous life uh, that involved uh, signing several stations on the air. Uh, I started a company that uh, 
reported on FCC technical information and data. So I know all the steps that are involved in applying for a license and in uh, you know trying to figure out the engineering end of things and studios set up and getting all the different permits, not just from the FCC and the hoops you have to jump through there, but also the local permits for things like the antenna, building the antenna, testing all the equipment, building the studio equipment, making a studio equipment uh, that actually works so that people can, can use it in an efficient manner manner, uh, especially when it's basically a broom closet, which is what we have. Thank you, United Temple, uh, and, uh, University of Temple United Methodist Church. We very much appreciate um, our new landlords. Um, and um, all of those things, uh, Mike has been in, uh, really the catalyst that's gotten all this going. So uh, big, big props to him. He's done just an incredible amount behind the scenes for independent media in this city over the last quarter century. And uh, I don't think gets or uh, seeks out uh, nearly as much credit as he deserves. So thank you for that. Um, and there are, are a bunch of other people who've uh, really done a lot to help make this happen. Um, uh, Earth on the Air Independent Media, which has been around for many years, and they are the official licensee for this station. And the, uh, Craig McDonald and the other folks on the board at Earth on the Air have certainly helped make this happen as well. Uh, Sally Soriano, uh, Liz White, uh, uh, Reverend Rich Lang, who's here tonight, who you'll hear from in, in a few minutes, uh, Maria Tomczyk, myself. I mean, there's a bunch of people who wanted to get this project going. And uh, the next step is now that we are on the air, uh, we are a Pacifica affiliate. So right now we're using a lot of the Pacifica national programming while we ramp up our ability to produce the local programming. The idea is over time to try and um, increase the amount of local programming that we're broadcasting. Um, and we're really looking for local activist groups, uh, local advocacy uh, folks, people who want to get their word, their story out, because there's just an incredible number of positive things happening in this community that don't get media coverage, um, that because it's not being uh, championed by an elected official or Amazon or Microsoft or whom or a real estate developer or whomever it doesn't get covered in the Seattle Times it doesn't necessarily get covered in the stranger and certainly doesn't get covered in TV news or any any of those other platforms that's what we're here for um, that's where uh, folks are probably familiar with a lot of the types of things that uh, Mike has been doing for years on Mind Over Matters on KEXP. Um, that variety of different issues and programming uh, that he's been having on that show for uh, a long, long time and Sally before him back in the old KCMU and the KCMU News Hour. Um, that's the sort of thing we want to be doing 24 seven on KODX. And, I hope everyone in this room can be thinking about how they can uh, help pitch in and make that happen because we, we need all the help we can get and all the voices we can get because we really want to get people's voices out there that are not normally heard in uh, broadcast media. Um, that is probably about as much talking as I want to do right now. Um, We'll have a Q&A later, and I'll come back up. And uh, my my cohort from Eat the Airwaves, and for many, many years, uh, Eat the State, which was another community uh, uh, independent media project that I worked on, and Lance is back here, and he was a, a co-conspirator on that for, um, well, we bo we're at both have gray hair, and we didn't when we started, so that, that tells you. Um, and Maria was involved in that for many, many years as a co-editor and writer, and she and I are still on Saturday mornings on KEXP, uh, along with Mike, and uh, she wanted to talk a little bit about uh, just sort of the context of why this, this is, is an important station. You wanna come on up. gonna get out my notes here I know it seems like I never use notes when I'm talking on the air but I always have notes in front of me because sometimes I have to look up the statistics here they don't all go in here and stay in here um, I was gonna talk a little bit about the difference between commercial uh, radio and commercial media and community radio and community media uh, and a little bit about media consolidation so that just to kind of put the low power FM stations in context, 
um, and why people might want to do what I what I consider to be media activism, which is establishing community radio stations, and in our particular case, a low-power FM station. And um, I, I think one of the be one of the best quotes that I've seen recently, somebody said, and I cannot remember who it was, that uh, independent media and a free press are the issue on which all other issues rest. So if you don't have an independent media and a free press, uh, it makes organizing in order to make change just so much more difficult than if you do. Uh, and that's really the reason why I've been working in independent media uh, for many, many years. Um, and it's why freedom of speech and freedom of the press are in the First Amendment, not in the Second or the Third Amendment or, or whatever. They're in the First Amendment because without those, you can't make change in government, literally. And making change in your community is very, very difficult too. So um, I want to talk a little bit too about the mainstream, what we call the mainstream media or corporate media. Uh, back when I graduated from high school, which is many years ago now, back in the 1980s, there were something like 50 corporations that owned the majority of the media outlets around the country. But after the Telecommunications Act of 1996 passed during the Clinton administration, that changed. And now there's something like six major corporations that own 90% of the media outlets here in the United States. I'm just going to read you that list of six corporations. Viacom, News Corporation, Comcast, CBS, Time Warner, and Disney. And we're hearing all the time about these companies wanting to do further mergers. For example, you might have heard recently this year about AT&T and Time Warner, Warner wanting to do a merger. Well, that's an example of these big uh, media corporations wanting to uh, do deals so that they can acquire or set up corporate partnerships with telecom companies because they realize that uh, media isn't just a TV, owning a lot of TV stations now, it's also owning access to the internet and the content of what you have on your cell phone. That's uh, something that we're going to be seeing in the near future, is a lot of these big media, these, big, these six big media companies trying to uh, take over or do mergers with telecom companies like Verizon or T-Mobile. And in fact, Comcast has been looking recently at T-Mobile. Although there hasn't been any official announcement, you can read about it in the business press. That's another merger that may be coming fairly soon. And then, of course, there's in our, in our own uh, backyard here, the TV behemoth Sinclair Broadcasting Group, uh, which owns the second highest number of TV stations in the US and the largest by area of coverage. Uh, they're purchasing Tribune Media, which recently changed its name to Trunk, T-R-U-N-C, uh, but it's Tribune Media. Tribune Media itself owns 39 more TV stations and uh, 10 daily newspapers. And this is the scary thing, is since the uh, 1996 Act, Telecommunications Act was passed, uh, these big media conglomerates have been lobbying Congress and getting a lot of regulations changed and a lot of other uh, bills passed that now are allowing them to not just own more outlets around the country, but to own multiple outlets within the same city and to own not just TV stations, but TV and radio and now newspapers as well in the same market. So uh, Sinclair Broadcasting um, is going, they uh, are taking over Como for TV here in Seattle, and maybe you've heard something about this, that some of the folks at the, at the local Como 4 TV uh, station who have been doing the news programming are complaining because Sinclair Broadcasting Group has this habit of pre-recording uh, these very conservative spots that they want that they want all of their outlets, their TV station outlets, to play along with their news, local news programming. And the Como 4 people are saying, well, you know, we don't want to play this stuff. 
and this is not the right market for these for this kind of right wing stuff you know so they've been playing them in the middle of the night whenever they whenever they can just to say okay look we've logged the time that you want us to play them we played them it's great but of course Sinclair is not happy with that so there's this back and forth and that's an example of how the larger uh, corporate owner can influence the content of a smaller uh, news station in one of their markets and the fact that Sinclair Broadcasting does this for all of the TV stations that it owns or is trying to do that for all of the TV stations that it owns and you see it too in the radio spectrum for radio stations there's something like five big companies that own most of the radio stations in the United States. iHeart I, Media is the big one. They used to be Clear Channel, but they changed their name. They own something like 850 radio stations in the United States. The second biggest radio uh, conglomerate is Cumulus, and they own about half as many. They're number two. So that tells you a little bit about where things are going in terms of media ownership. Uh, and so what is the response to that if you want a good local media, uh, a healthy local media environment, and you want at least one or two stations you can listen to on the air, on, on, you know, over, over the radio waves or on TV, w what's the solution to that? Well. Folks have come up with a concept called community radio, which is really the res or community broadcasting, which is really the response to the dominance of commercial broadcasting and the consolidation of media ownership. Now, there's a couple kinds of nonprofit models that you that you see in just about every market. One of those are educational stations, stations that are owned by universities. For example, uh, KUOW, the University of Washington, owns their license, um, although they may be run somewhat independently of the University of Washington. They're still affiliated with the University of Washington. The UW owns their license. Uh, KBT, I think, believe it's KBTC, the PBS TV affiliate in the in the Tacoma market, they're owned by Bates Technical College. Um, those are a couple of examples of educational nonprofits. There are stations owned by the government, for example, Seattle Community Network Scan, that's uh, owned by the city of Seattle. There's a Seattle Channel, which uh, airs programming. They uh, they air, for example, the Seattle City Council meetings and so forth. Um, and then there are nonprofits that operate larger full power radio stations. For example, KEXP and um, the uh, KNKX, which used to be KPLU. Those are two examples of uh, stations that used to be part of an educational institutions but are now run by a separate nonprofit board. They've kind of separated themselves from the educational from their educational origins and are now considered mostly community powered or, or community uh, based radio stations. Um, but they're full power. And if you look at how KNKX, the friends of KNKX, took over the KPLU station, it was not cheap. Now the history there is KPLU needed money and they thought one way we can get some money in the door is we can sell the license and the equipment for KPLU to the University of Washington. They can do this merger with KUOW and the programming will change, etc. But people who were very happy with the jazz programming and some of the uh, local news programming on KPLU said, no, don't sell to the, to the University of Washington we want an opportunity to try to buy the station. But they had to raise seven million dollars to buy that, the license, to buy the equipment, to get a building where they could move it all to and to have operating funds for the first year or two. That's a lot of money and that's a very high bar for a lot of community radio stations if you want to, for example, buy a commercial radio station and turn it into a community radio station, it's going to be more expensive than that. So enter, so low power FM enters the picture at that point. 
And I don't know a whole lot about the history of low power FM. I do know that it came out of the pirate radio movement and maybe Mike can talk about this a little bit more than I can. But uh, low power FM stations can broadcast, they broadcast with a lower signal. Uh, you can have many more of them in a community than you can full powered uh, radio stations. And the financial bar is lower. It's not cheap but it's certainly a lot lower than $7 million to get a station started and to get it operating. And uh, the operating costs are generally lower because the very definition of community-powered radio is not just broadcasting to the community uh, content that reflects the community's concerns, but also getting help from the community through volunteers coming to the station to learn how to produce content to talk about the issues that impact them and that matter for them and to uh, financially contribute to the station as well. So that's why we're doing Low Power FM and that's why we're all here tonight, hopefully. So um, that was my presentation. <laughs> um, and I know uh, we were probably gonna take some questions later. So um, if folks had questions then, you can. I would like to just turn over the mic now to, it looks like we have Nick Lakata here tonight. Oh, Rich, were you going to speak first or? <laughs> what do you think, Mike? Okay, why don't we have Nick come up. Nick Lakata. Our, our former uh, Seattle City Council member, and maybe a Seattle City Council member again. Well, we'll see. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to sit down here. May I stand up? Here we go. This is a little... um, I think this is exciting that uh, doing a little powered station. And it's sort of interesting because um, I've been thinking about this uh, for a number of uh, reasons. First of all, I. I became more familiar with community-powered radio stations around the country when I was doing my sort of uh, occasional book, book readings in different cities. And I came across them in places like uh, Austin and Pittsburgh and um, in Indianapolis and uh, some other cities that I didn't expect. And in, um, in Austin, um, I also happened to run uh, at the uh, community-powered radio station. One of the people there is Thorne Dreyer, who uh, helped start the station, and he also actually helped start um, the RAG, uh, which was Austin's uh, alternative newspaper, and is actually the, was one of the original uh, alternative underground newspapers that they call back in the, I think '65, '66 era. And at what time there were as many as uh, 300 of them around the country. What was interesting is that they, they all lasted for about a decade, and then most of them passed out. But um, as I was going around, and I ended up writing actually a, a, a book review on a book they put out called Celebrating the Rag in, the, um, in Znet, I became aware that there's also a network of community radio stations. And I don't know if there's a, a network of um, low-powered FM stations, but there in my mind, I was thinking, there's an analogy here of another national network that can take, a, for hopes, hopefully could take a significant role in moving our politics, in, basically, uh, in a more progressive fashion and particularly address one of the biggest problems we face in this nation is the, the wealth gap between the 1% and the rest of us, which is basically, I believe, destroying our democracy. Um, and so, by creating this station and other stations, I, I would hope that we would use these stations uh, not only to disperse great information, but also to support local uh, in, uh, organizing efforts to make them more effective. And then also to communicate with other stations in other cities to learn how we could, you know, exchange information, which is like one of the things the when the underground press was operating, they had a thing uh, called, no, oh, I can't remember, you even wrote about it. Um, anyhow, it was, it was basically, a, um, um, I'm going to say a society, but an institute connecting all the underground papers together. 
And um, there may be, I don't know if you've addressed this job, but there may be something like that for either community stations or uh, low powered stations. But um, aside from you know, trying to seek out foundation money, what was interesting about the underground papers is that none of them had any um, foundation money. They were all community based, very dependent on volunteers. Um, but they also sold limited uh, sort of uh, classified ads or something of that sort. They did try to develop some revenue streams, and I'm not sure what the business model is for the, the low-powered stations. And the, but even the community stations do try to bring in revenue from supporting um, local stores, often co-ops and working out arrangements. So I'm always thinking about how to create networks and um, – one of the ways that uh, it occurred to me is that one of the more uh, successful networks in Seattle that's local is PCC. And uh, they would be uh, a logical, I would think, place to go to support the growth of uh, radio stations like this or low-powered or community uh, radio stations. And there are other equivalent co-ops in other cities. so. This is the kind of thing I wish that I was 20 years old and could devote all my life to. I would love to be able to, I would love to be able to to link these efforts together in different cities, because by doing that, uh, we have learned that we have more power. Um, and just one quick example: for instance, when Seattle adopted the $15 minimum wage, we did so before, for instance, the archetype of a, of the progressive city, San Francisco, did. You know, we were there before them. We were there before. Um, New York, Chicago, all the major cities, all the cities that had more money, and in fact, is just the number of people who were more progressive, more radical, more socialist. But we did it here in Seattle, and it did roll out and affect many other cities and states as well, even this state, in raising the minimum wage. So there is a, what I call like a, a tailwind when you do something, but people have to know about it. If they don't know about it, they're not going to be a tailwind. So, um, I view uh, media and radio stations in particular as sort of a new generation of a uh, tool that we can have to create greater uh, movements, stronger movements, and, and, and more effective uh, change out there. Um, and I would hope, and I'd be glad to, as you go forward with the, ra with the radio station, work with you in making some of these connections so that not only this station survives, but that um, the readership grows and the connection with groups out there that need to get their material out. Um, so I think there's a, I think the future actually, I'm so sort of optimist, is, um, I wouldn't say it's rosy, but I think it's, it's broad. I think there's a, a lot of opportunities out there. And I think that with uh, this effort, we can actually open that door and move forward towards it. So I, I want to thank all the folks who've, who've begun it, and now it's other people like myself to make sure that it's successful and to, to help create this link. And let me just end by saying one of the uh, reasons I believe this is a good way to go and, and can succeed is a few years ago I, I helped start a thing called Local Progress, which is linking progressive municipal officials around the country. Now there's 500 people in there. That is a source of people who are presumably connected to community uh, radio stations and hopefully connected to low-powered FM stations. It would be great to reach out to those to help them publicize the fact that these radio stations exist and get their word out through them. So I, I see it as an um, organic, growing uh, movement and that uh, radio stations play a, a critical role in that effort. So... That's my uh, that's my perspective, and I, I hope it's shared by others. Thank you, <laughs> Richard. Where'd uh, Rich go? Okay, here you go. I think I just became the MC. Um, so, um, as as you can tell, we we have a highly organized program here tonight. We did want to have uh, a little bit of uh, Q and A time. Um, I need I need to be move into the. Move, move into the camera here, um, but um, for, uh, Mike, did did you talk with Rich about? Um, 
Oh, okay. Um, well, uh, should should the 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 idea is that we were going to have uh, Rich, who uh, is of course very experienced at such things, uh, do the uh, do the the appeal for folks to help with uh, with financing this station, and we also of course are looking for volunteers uh, because 168 hours a week of uh, airtime is a lot of radio time to fill. Uh, so if you have ideas for programming, if there are other things you can do to help, whether it's database or promotion or media work with, with you know, spreading the word, whatever, uh, community groups, whatever it might be, uh, be thinking about that. Be thinking about ways in which you can help because we could really, really use your help. Um, and uh, maybe we should go ahead and, uh, Maria, do you want to come up here? And uh, Nick, also, if you're available and don't have to run off. Yeah, yeah, if we can just bring, bring, bring a couple of tears. Huh? Well, let's, let's, let's set this up first so that we're actually can, can get, um, can the camera actually pick us up? Is this? Okay, well, we're friends. This, this will work. <laughs> okay, yeah, sure, go ahead. That is something that uh, the expert would be Mike, who is uh, 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 trying to get as far into the back of the room as possible, who would, would actually know the number on that. Um, yeah, Mike. Yeah. Grab a, grab a chair. Mike, Mike is famously averse at, at uh, public attention, but we're, we're going to put him up here under the bright lights. Uh, can, you, can you talk about that for a second? Yeah, it's it's roughly in an operation like this. It's roughly about a uh, thousand bucks a month for a bare minimum. Um, with more money, we can you know do more projects and stuff. Um, be able to do more like live remotes, which we're really excited about doing. Um, one of the things that corporate media has the resources to do, but oddly never seems overly interested unless. Um, unless it's a tragedy, or let's say the WTO, which um, I didn't perceive as a tragedy, it seemed the exact opposite. Um, they can go out to these different events that we uh, have out in the community, protests, rallies, things like that, and they could be covering them for us, but they, that doesn't serve their agenda. So we're really looking forward to being able to do that on a regular basis, so, um, you know, if we, had you know the funding to be able to do that which again through the the wonderful uh, one of the benefits of the technology available to us now um, that's relatively easy to do I mean we all carry around actually or a lot of us carry around little devices that transmit over the airwaves you know people's voices and or images and we can be sharing that we can be feeding those into a transmitter that then broadcasts that instead of just to the front person you're calling broadcasts it to many people so um, so we're that's just one of the many examples of things we're looking forward to being able to do with this new tool that we um, have here at uh, U Temple. So hopefully that answers the question. Yeah, and and uh, parenthetically to that, everyone involved, at least at this point, and probably for the uh, uh, near future at least, is is a volunteer. We do not have any paid staff at this point. So uh, we want to keep the overhead low. We want to focus on getting local programming going. That uh, that and uh, the the church has been very generous in making space available to us for the the studio. Uh, so we're mostly interested in building our programming capacity at this point. Um, and secondly, uh, broadcast stations do remotes all the time for, from car dealerships and uh, stereo shops and things like that. They know how to do remotes. It's just that's a reflection of their priorities. Uh, who in the back? Yay. Did you meet with Nick when you were still on the council talking to you about the permit issue? We have, uh, we had a lot of things that we had to go through. I don't know, Mike, if you want to share some of the startup costs. I mean, $1,000 a month doesn't sound like much, but the startup costs have been um, hefty for some of the stations. 
It would be nice if Mike could get paid back for some of those at some point. Yeah. <laughs> he, the, the Bank of Mike has helped get the station going. Uh, quite, not, not strictly him, but he's, he's been a big part. Uh, well, if you're, uh, that's, it seems like there's two questions there. So, um, as a station licensed by the FCC, you have to install certain, um, equipment, the EAS emergency alert system, you know, which we're all familiar with from, you know, growing up, basically they put together for in case of like nuclear attack and, um, <laughs> sorry. I, Having worked in another station, I can tell you that's not a system you want to rely on for your news of when that's coming. Um, but beyond that, this station will have a fairly <laughs> robust system for that. And it's, uh, again, it's just, it's, the government gets to decide when they send out the alerts on that. And all the stations have weekly tests. And again, we've all heard those tones that, that I know they've changed over the years. But so that's one thing. But it sounded like your question was a little different towards... On major fault lines. Uh -huh. Every neighborhood where there'll be a hub with emergency supplies and people ready in, you know, in the event of specifically a volcano or an earthquake. Right. That everybody will be able to communicate with the city through a, uh, a shortwave radio that would then go, I mean, I'm envisioning that it would then go to our station so that people are ready with their transistors, solar radio, so you're, what have you. You're saying like, you're saying like, happened with the, so you're saying you're saying like what happened in New York with Hurricane Sandy where people in the neighborhoods set up communication systems places where people could charge cell phones that kind of thing um, could be the could be the hub for something like that that's an interesting idea yeah um, mm-hmm Everything, yeah. Still works. Having, having back in a previous life, worked at a radio station in Galveston during a hurricane, uh, <laughs> and of course that happened again recently, um, it, it's, a, it's invaluable. And I, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a different point, but not really. Uh, the city of Seattle actually is in a state of emergency right now around homelessness. And uh, uh, maybe more media folks locally should be paying attention to that emergency too. Uh, that's the kind of emergency that needs more coverage and needs stations like KODX and, and, uh, and the station in Ballard as well. So uh, anyone else have a question? I had some other hands up. Second, um, yeah, the uh, Mayor Murray declared an emergency, and it was a bit of a discussion early on with the council because legally, an emergency generally in the past had only been for a few days. WTL, in fact, was w when they declared an emergency, and then uh, it's generally used for physical, uh, well, earthquake they had in mind, but something that would be uh, generated from a natural cause. So declaring the emergency for homelessness was, on one hand, a very great political statement. On the other hand, they haven't used the tools available that you get in an emergency. So it has, and that's what my criticism was while I was even on the council, well, it existed, was that you are deadening down the dramatic importance of having an emergency for housing if you're in a constant state of emergency and you're not using those powers. So the radio stations that are responsive to the community could, in fact, repeatedly say, we're in day 450 of emergency. What are we doing about this emergency? So people need to be reminded about those kinds of things. And that's the kind of role that 
you know commercial stations won't even touch with a 10-foot pole, but the community stations and the low-powered stations have the ability to do that. You you can you can you can do it you can do it for for isolated events, but you cannot have any kind of a meaningful amount of of simulcasting in different stations. You have to have original uh, uh, programming. Um, although you can share some programming. Yeah, the, yeah. You know, I, the, the, qu the question. The yeah, the question was simulcast, but certainly, and that's something that some of the different LPFMs around town have been talking informally about. And I suspect it'll get more formal as, as some of these stations uh, get up and running and better established and organized is sharing programming and resources so that, for instance, if something's happening in the U District and we have somebody there to record it, we can share that with somebody down in Rainier Valley or Ballard or, or you know, Lake Forest Park or wherever that, that uh, doesn't have the ability to get somebody down there, but it might be of interest to them. Uh, that kind of networking is is hugely beneficial and we already have a, a certain amount of communication going on between the different LPFM projects in town. I, I hope that gets uh, broader and more formalized. Um, I could see one variation on that particular question is um, certainly there are events where we've seen other corporate stations all covering simultaneously, maybe not from the exact same feed, but you know, we've seen multiple stations doing a presidential address, you know, or the governor doing something. Um, uh, we, we saw multiple stations again covering the WTO events. Now they were at different angles and they had different people in the streets, but over a given time period, um, a lot of those were live broadcasts, so they were still covering the same thing. So I guess it kind of, it's, there's some gray area there. It would depend on what the particular event you were that you were simulcasting. Um, and whether you had gone in planning to do that, but I would think there's some wiggle room there as to, um, you know, whether stations could, they probably wouldn't be combining efforts, they just happened to all arrive at the event at the same time, so. <laughs> Not that I'm encouraging anyone to, you know, break the laws, um, because, yeah, yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> all right, sounds like a conspiracy to me. Uh, yeah. Oh, and I don't have, <laughs> don't have the schedule. Yeah, we have a, a kind of a generic schedule. Uh, obviously, to begin with, we're looking at doing. Um, we won't have as much live, in-house produced content as we get rolling. We're still technically we're in a test phase at the moment. Um, so uh, I don't know if it got mentioned. If we're we're going to be a Pacifica affiliate, so initially we're going to be playing a lot of Pacifica content just because that's available. And I realize that Pacifica um, has some issues. They're kind of falling apart. They're like a really old truck that's falling apart, but it's still like that truck you love, you know, that you're, you're used to. Um, and, and there's a lot of reasons for I'm um, hoping that Pacifica pulls together and, and gets through this. So um, we will be using a lot of their content initially. One of the beauties of Pacifica is they're also a platform that you can, uh, getting to Nick's issue, you can share with other Pacifica affiliates. Um, so content we produce here, we fully plan to produce at a high enough quality that other stations will want to carry it, hopefully, as well as amongst the LPFMs. There's, um, there was talk early on when the LPFMs were putting in their um, applications for FCC licenses that a bunch of the stations wanted to share content so um, that will be happening um, there's been in in with small stations across the US and worldwide there's been content sharing for going back for at least the last 20 years that I've been aware of and uh, content I've shared at KCMU and KXP has been produced a lot of it's been produced by other stations so um, there's a rich history of, of sharing uh, obviously, the LPFMs are ripe for doing a lot more sharing, and um, and again, it's it, it 
a lot of the content will benefit us all. I mean, how many of us, as an example, when we were struggling, at least I was struggling, uh, and I know Nick was too, um, questioning the, the wisdom of multiple large sports stadiums in Seattle and the amount of resources we th have thrown into that and that we're still paying for, as Craig reminded me today, we're all still paying for the kingdom. How's that working out for you? Um, if we had only known, if the corporate media had only um, informed us that, oh, guess what, there's 24 other cities that are struggling with this too, and if we had known and been able to join together with them, we would have quashed that from, you know, the third day in, you know? Instead, they kept us, you know, divided, and, and they be, were able to shove those down our throats. So, again, that's one of the powers I'm looking forward to with um, having numerous small community stations, so. Oh, sorry, I have totally. <laughs> um, okay. Um, I don't have the printout with me, but. Oh, but it's on the fly. Yeah, Democracy Now, one of the ones. And, yeah. He's getting it. He's getting the flyer. Uh, we're still kind of working out when to time this. Of course, we're going to be looking at when that we think the highest listenership will be during drive times in the in the morning and in the afternoon. Um, one of the shows that we want to locally produce eventually is a news sh a local news show. Um, I don't know if people remember way back when uh, KEXP was KCMU and on the University of Washington campus, one of the projects that Earth on the Air was heavily involved in was doing a regular news show, um, and we're looking at reviving that. So that's something that we want to do. We're not exactly sure when we're going to be broadcasting that or when we're going to get that up and going, but we definitely have that as a goal. And Mike's got a list here of yeah. some shows. Yeah, this whole project is basically the revenge of a curse, so. <laughs> so, um, so some of the, the Pacifica-produced shows that we're looking uh, forward to airing is Democracy Now!, Against the Grain, uh, Rising Up, Flashpoints, uh, Background Briefing, Letters f uh, to Washington, Sojourner Truth, Hard Knock Radio, Informativo Pacifica, uh, Voices of the Middle East and Talk Nation Radio. Those are just a few. Um, we also, non-Pacifica produced shows. Uh, Richard Wolf does a weekly economic update. We're looking at that. Intercepted with Jeremy Scahill is actually a podcast that we've been negotiating to be able to um, carry that. Um, if we can only teach Jeremy to not use potty words. Uh, <laughs> Loud and Clear, which is produced uh, by Sputnik Radio, uh, Between the Lines. Uh, produced in, um, I think, Massachusetts. I can't remember the exact name. Um, so, Connecticut. Connecticut, yeah. So those are some of the content. Obviously, there's going to be more content from Pacifica. The other thing I, I really want to touch on, which is something unique to our station that I'm actually really excited about that we haven't touched on yet, was um, we're, we are working with, uh, starting out with a, a dozen different local grassroots organizations that are going to be producing their own regular shows and then also supplying us with content to, that we'll be able to weave into our news segments. Um, three of those organizations, well, one, okay, three of those organizations are based out of this church. Um, Shiloh Murphy, who I'm not sure if he's here with the uh, Needle Exchange, is going to be producing a regular show. Um, Facing Homelessness is going to be producing a regular show. They actually just moved out a couple weeks ago to a location down at uh, the Friends Center, a few blocks away, six blocks away. And um, Roots Youth Homeless Shelter is also going to be producing a show. Um, there's other organizations locally that are um, psyched to produce shows. Um, Hanford Challenge, there's a couple organizations uh, working on the Hanford issue that are going to be producing shows. Um, WPSR is looking at regularly doing a show. Um, Heart of America Northwest. Yeah, sorry, I roll through the acronyms. <laughs> sorry, I talk too fast sometimes because, you know, two minutes before the break. Um, so that and, and other groups we're really psyched about working with, and I'm pretty sure that we're the only station I've heard of that's ever um, worked that um, closely with different, again, local grassroots progressive organizations to help them amplify their voice and get their word out to more people. So.
And, and one of the things we want to do related to that, um, you know, we talked about this as a, a launch party tonight, but we want to start doing uh, regular, maybe monthly events where uh, a, a couple things, well, one, doing uh, issues and presentations, which of course we can then also record and broadcast, but also doing uh, trainings and teaching people how to do radio, how to produce their own programming, how to do messaging, not just for radio, but also social media and other uh, other different platforms that uh, organizations pretty much have to know how to use to be effective these days. So we very much see our mission as not just uh, providing a platform for local activist groups and people concerned about different issues to get their message out, but also helping them to more effectively communicate that message and produce programming that can reach a great larger audience. So we're really excited about that. And then uh, Mike has been trying for about 20 years to teach Maria and I not to use potty words. So I, I think it's uh, kind mostly, of a lost cause. Mostly, mostly successfully. Um, mostly. Yeah, we also, one of my personal goals in working on this project too is to help teach people media analysis skills and um, how to maybe do a little bit of the analysis that Java and I have been able to do for years, first with uh, Eat the State and then with Eat the Airwaves. People are always asking me, how do you do reportage? How do you do uh, uh, analysis of the news and then turn around and be able to produce a show where you're making where you're doing commentary on the week's news and um, it requires some skill and some uh, tricks that are not that hard to learn but that I would like to teach and to pass on to other people so that this kind of a, this kind of program can be done by other folks in other markets or on other stations so uh, that's one of my personal goals for this and I really look forward to doing some of those kinds of trainings and uh, also learning myself how to produce uh, shows for for the radio for the radio station too and not just produce um, content that other people record so that's something that I think will be really exciting about this station is just that uh, people will be able to come in and um, will be able to be doing these trainings and give them the tools that if they uh, want to produce shows for KODX they can or they can if say they're a student at the University of Washington they want to come in and do some real hands-on work with a radio station which you don't really get to do anymore at the University of Washington they can and then they can take those skills and do it in another community once they graduate and, and move somewhere else so that's another uh, goal we have um, other questions or comments yeah Crab Radio is kind of an interesting. Crab Radio is kind of an interesting example. They were started in 1963, and I think they were one of the first uh, examples of a community-based radio station. Um, and I know they were uh, on the air through the 70s because I remember listening to them as late as I think 1981 or 82, maybe 80. Maybe that was shortly before they went off the air. But they were um, a going station and a vibrant and fun station to listen to uh, through the 70s and into the early 80s. So, um. <laughs> okay, here we go. Yeah, here you go. Mike. And that. Thank you for the segue. Um, we're actually going to have um, Chuck Grinch, who's the archivist for Crab Radio, having a regular spot on this station. And um, through the assistance of Jack Straw Foundation, 
um, will be airing um, this great old content that um, I've been listening to some of that's like, you know, stuff produced like in the 60s and 70s that's still totally relevant now, which, and just historical stuff that, you know, blows your mind if you, you know, familiar with Seattle at all. So I'm really excited about that. Yeah, how is it? Sabrina, was there even a station that went up in West Seattle? Well, there was an applicant, but they okay. didn't have a oh. through on it. So okay. Okay. Damn. Something wrong. Yeah, let, um, so to answer your question, um, we're just waiting for internet. Um, we're just waiting for the 21st century to come to U Temple. So. Um, <laughs> And, and again, as long as this process has been with the FCC, CenturyLink is competitive with how long it takes. Yeah, it's high-speed internet at the speed of a snail. Um, so we're actually hoping in the next couple of weeks, they said, CenturyLink said they would have something in next week, but um, they've been saying that for six months now. So um, soon, and we'll be happy to let you know as soon as it happens. But we want it too, because we need it to be able to run the station efficiently, so. Sorry. Back to West Seattle for a second. What's interesting about West Seattle is they probably, and they up until a few years, and I was haven't been tracking it since, have one of the most um, effective and ongoing uh, news blogs. Yes. West, and um, West Seattle blog is is actually, I'm not sure they're breaking new news, but they certainly keep people yeah. very well informed. They do. they do break news, and um, initially there were a number of blogs per neighborhoods, and again I think a number of them have faded off, but that's the kind of network we should be thinking about is with such a strong blog in West Seattle, is there any way to um, have that energy help support an uh, LPFM there or at least get the LPFMs there in other places out to West Seattle in some fashion through podcasts or something? So um, again, just thinking of that interconnectivity. Uh, yeah, in, uh, other hands? They're, yeah, in the back. Well, you guys do marketing for the station. Yeah. Well, I, you have a we, you have a Facebook page, right? Because I think that's yes. where I got something. One hundred percent of it so far has been Facebook. Uh, that's what I thought. Facebook can be. By the way, on Facebook, what's uh, again? It's not just using the so. Well, it's not just posting something on social media. It's knowing how to use it. And so, um, you know, for instance, as um, you have a personal page and you can have a fan page, you can have more than one fan page. And you can boost fan pages, you know, for 15 bucks. You can um, actually direct your market to not either a city or actually a portion of the city. Uh, the Russians got it down really good in the election. So, uh, so one of the things that, uh, again, is uh, the help that the station might use, I don't know how, if you have people, uh, experts in social media, but as you look at volunteers, you have volunteers that can help in that area, that would be a good way to uh, manipulate the social media. And then also it makes it much more stronger if you could tie it into a ongoing, I'm sure like you know, an email database. So you're continually going back to that. Yeah, we're, we're working on uh, uh, recruiting volunteers for a troll farm that we're setting up. Uh, <laughs> no, we, um, I, I think once we are up and running and doing the live streaming and everything else, there, we would like to get a Facebook community going. We'd like to get a, a Twitter following going, you know, all the different social media platforms. We, you, in the, in the current media environment, you basically have to use all the platforms that are out there. And, uh, and have them all reinforcing each other. And one of the great advantages of KODX and having call letters and having an FCC license, as I mentioned early on, is it gives legitimacy to all those other 
you know, we're, we're not just uh, some random person on the internet with an opinion. We're several random people on the internet with an opinion, but we also have call letters behind it, so it makes it official. So, but yeah, at, at the moment, I think uh, a lot of it's been Facebook and word of mouth. Word of mouth is always hugely important. Tell your friends this exists. Um, and, you know, Facebook and Twitter are, are basically just extensions of word of mouth. But, uh, you know, the more local groups that we can get involved in this, the more people can tell other people, uh, the happier we'll be and the, the bigger base we'll have to draw from for getting local programming up and going, and it all just feeds on itself. Um, not formally, unless Mike, Mike, you haven't been telling me something. Um, I have several contacts over there. Um, I, we, I think we want to press all those buttons going forward. Um, and basically so far we've been so focused on just getting the station up and going that a lot of that's not in place yet, but yeah, that's, that's certainly on the list. There's, uh, there's between, um, between KBCS and the other LPFMs, and uh, you know, Nick mentioned West Seattle Blog. There's also South Seattle Emerald, and there's uh, uh, several which I'm writing for now. Uh, there's several different other strong community blogs around the around the city uh, that uh, I, I think, at one level or another, we'd like to develop relationships with. And you know, again, that's something that other LPFMs are going to be looking at doing in their local communities as well. Uh, it doesn't just fall on us to, you know, cover the whole city. We can make this a collaborative effort with all the other stations that are out there, too. And this, this is Sabrina Roach from uh, Brown Paper Tickets, and she's also been tremendously helpful with LPFMs around town. So. And she used to work for KBCS. So. Thank you. 
And, and that's not always true. I mean, in some uh, cities, the even just the nonprofit full power stations have fought the low power FM stations. So we're really fortunate in this city that we haven't encountered that here. So um, that's something that we're really looking forward to is, you know, getting involved more and uh, doing a little bit of cross pollinating there where there's where we can see some um, openings there to, to share. That would be really cool. And so that map is certainly not a fixed thing. And it like, like Sabrina says, it's organic and it's still developing and we're still trying to kind of get the resources together to put that all together. But again, you know, these lights are coming on all over the city with the, as these stations are coming online. So, you know, that map's going to expand. So it's exciting. Yeah. She's great. Yep. Very good. Okay. KVRU. 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 Okay. Other other uh, questions? Maybe we'll take one or two more. In the back, yeah. Well, the challenge. Yes, we'll, we'll we'll get we'll we'll get to the opportunities in a second. Um, I think um, the more that we get out and involved in the community and involved with different groups and uh, different people, certainly cultural folks as well, uh, the more opportunities we have for events. Uh, so that's that's one avenue. I don't think uh, we want to spend. And you know, this is—I'm just talking off the top of my head now because all this is subject to change. We're brand new. Um, we're going to be primarily, I think, dependent on our listeners, uh, dependent on listeners, groups that participate uh, and produce programs and uh, can can uh, publicize KODX to their lists. Um, we, you know, I think we'll probably be doing some local underwriting and support from local businesses, particularly in the U District. But uh, at this point, I think our most reliable source of funding, frankly, is our listeners, and uh, particularly listeners in the activist community who appreciate the need for this this kind of platform and this kind of voice. So that I think early on will be the most uh, the most obvious uh, direction that we'll take it, and then you know, in terms of more creative ideas or more ambitious types of fundraising uh, you know we don't have our bequest program up and running just yet we don't have our uh, you know 2,000 seat annual breakfast just yet but um, maybe we'll get there maybe we won't but um, but uh, we we do have a radio station we have a, we have a lot of ideas for producing pretty awesome content that uh, people will appreciate and uh, you know, uh, having that content out there is the thing that fundraises most effectively for us. So I got a quick, quick question. What do you expect to be the range that people uh, be able to listen to the station? How far north, east, and west will it go? Well, there's a uh, there's a, a little map that's hard to. Uh, yeah. Is everybody? Is everything here to be reached? Well, in theory, that was um, so. In theory, there's a small map on the flyers that gives you a sense for what the initial pattern would be, where people should be able to re get the signal um, reasonably. Um, so basically, it goes as far north as like North Gateway is the far northern tip. The southern tip is the south tip of of South Lake Union, the body of water, um, Lake Union, um, and then. We've got out to, to geography. So yeah. For example, Capitol Hill, it might be harder because there's a hill there. Is um, it line of sight? Yeah, it's, line, it's line, line of sight. Is, yeah. Line. And, yeah. But there may be some people on the. There may be some folks on the east side of the lake who can hear it. So you know who who face in this direction, or you know, for example, Lower Queen Anne Hill might be able to hear it. 
um, and people on the east side slope of Queen Anne Hill, but if, as you go towards Magnolia, you're not going to be able to hear it. So it's subject to geography, but um, North Gateway, uh, folks in Greenwood, Ballard on the east side of Ballard, uh, Wallingford, Fremont, where we know you can hear it down East Lake. We're hoping South Lake Union, at least lower Queen Anne and the you know east side of Queen Anne Hill, um, and you know the north end of Capitol Hill. So it's a, got a pretty good range, I think, but it's going to be variable. Yeah, it, it depends on line of sight. Um, I live downtown. It comes in downtown, uh, not great, but well enough. Um, so and that was a surprise we didn't expect it to get that far south but apparently it does uh we was talking to somebody here who was trying to pick it up in uh magnuson park or not magnuson park um the one yeah no Mag magnuson park and was not able to um so it's it's gonna vary uh but you know that that person is in the shadow of you ridge somebody in the east side of ballard might be in the shadow of finney ridge so you know it's gonna vary depending on the topography that's why we want to stream so uh, the, the sooner we can get the streaming going, the better. Is there a regulation on how high your antenna Yes, there is. Um, so with low power FM, or actually any FM, uh, the limits on the type of license that you have and the limits on the, uh, uh, the size of the signal um, the, the, signal is, the signal range is calculated by the height above average terrain and by the power. Uh, the, so the higher the antenna is, the lower your power is to get the same effective radiated power. And it's the effective radiated power we have to worry about. So if we, incre we can increase the power all we want, but we'd have to decrease the tower. And of course, we have a very fixed tower height because that's what we built and that's what the FCC approved and that's what the city approved. Uh, so there's not a lot of flexibility there. Uh, the other thing you have to protect is other stations on the same frequency, like a 96.9, I believe there's one in Olympia um, that you know, if we get much stronger, we'll interfere with that. You also have to uh, protect uh, first adjacent and second adjacent. So for example, uh, we're on 96.9, Classic Rock is on 96.5, somebody else is on 97.3. So it can't be too much stronger or we might be interfering with those signals. And you know, you don't want the big corporate stations with their, their lawyers on retainer coming after us. So, uh, so we're pretty limited in what we can do for a broadcast signal. That's again, why we wanna be able to stream. As high as the highest mountain, as deep as. <laughs> it's as high as the tower outside, you said, by the, uh, yeah. the church, I imagine, a steeple yeah, or something? I think the tower is like 130 feet. And then our, 130 feet? And then the mast is 20 feet, and, but the antenna isn't quite all the way up to the top of the mast. So, yeah, it's around. Yeah. And this neighborhood, I think, is about 200 feet above sea level. So. Uh, we're, we're, yeah, we're, we're a little below uh, Queen Anne Hill. Probably the tower itself is close. I don't think we'll go over Queen Anne Hill so that we're, you're, it's audible on but the other side of the hill. But if you're at the top, you might. Yeah, if you're at the top, you should be able to get it. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, other questions? Um, Rich, do you want to come up here and join the party? You can have, you can have my seat, yeah, my or you can just walk around. Just walk around. This is uh, no. This is um, this is really how it works. Uh, just like you, I came here tonight because I am celebrating. I think this is a great idea. I think this is how democracy works. This is a hopeful sign. I come walking in here, and Mike says, "Hey, would you do the ask?" <laughs> <laughs> so please, please. <laughs> so <laughs> this is where it starts. Um, um, on the back of this, and well, it depends on what the front and the back is, you can see how you can contribute both online and via check. But I will pass, because I am a preacher, I'll just pass this around and y'all can contribute a little bit. And what will start tonight is a little will grow and grow and grow and eventually will take over the world. Um, um, I, I wanted to uh, just, though, express some thanks to all of us for being here tonight because we really live, uh, I don't know if you're feeling it, I certainly feel it, 
we're living in increased times of real oppression um, and, and just sadness, just everyday sadness. And for us to be here tonight is a vote for the future. It's a vote of confidence, a vote of belief, and a vote of trust, and a vote of faith in each other. And so it means something. Um, one of my greatest hopes that will come out of this, though, um, and I know if you're like me, you're probably tired of hearing this, but it really is. I came with my son tonight, who's 27. One of my greatest hopes is that, um, and I, I forgot who said it, but someone talked about this being a farm team. One of my greatest hopes is that this will be used throughout the city to cultivate, to mentor, and develop the voices of our young adults in this city. Uh, because us boomers now are moving off stage, and, uh, um, and, but a new generation is coming up, and if whatever and however we can help them uh, work for justice um, is a positive. So thank you for being here tonight, and thank you for your contributions. And Mike, do you want to have the last word here and send us off? Otherwise, I'll, otherwise I'll start praying or something. <laughs> Uh, yeah, just a couple of things. And, and by the way, unlike uh, political contributions, there is no individual limit on the size checks you can write. So just bear that in mind. Um, Earth on the Air Independent Media, if you're writing a check. Uh, and thank you to, yeah, and if you, um, if, if you are interested in, in volunteering, just come up and talk to us afterwards. Uh, did, did we want to head over somewhere afterwards? Can we talk about that? Okay. Yeah, we we had, <laughs> we, yeah we had we had some uh, informal talk about uh, the, the proximity of different brew pubs to this location, uh, so we may head over there in a little bit. Uh, but uh, if you are interested in uh, volunteering, please come up and talk to one of us or or Sally, who's over here also. Uh, but uh, we would love to have more voices. We'd love to have more people with just the ordinary day-to-day -day operating issues, uh, show people how to work the boards so that you know we, we uh, can actually have people staffing the station 24-7. Um, you know, all of these different things. There's a lot of different ways people can get involved, and we're really, really excited about this. So thank you to all. Oh, uh, one other ask that I wanted to do while we're here. Uh, Nick, who very graciously spent his time with us tonight, is uh, one of the finalists for the interim city council position that is up. And um, the city council will be voting on that on Friday, so now would be an awesome time to email your city council member and let them know if you have strong feelings on who you would like to support as an interim city council person, I think Nick would be great. Uh, but that's just that's just my opinion. Um, so thank all of you for being here. That's the most exciting part. Um, uh, it's great to have so many people here. After after a, a few of us have been working on this for months and months and years, it's really great to see that there's actually other people who are excited about this too, that we're the same as we are. So uh, thank you all for being here tonight, and we'll see you in the future on this. <laughs>